Hello, everyone. It's time to eat, drink, and be merry with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy. Known as San Diego's sustainable chef, Jeremy Manley is back on Big Blend Radio's Eat, Drink, and Be Merry show today to teach us how to make a flourless chocolate cake. Mm, Gluten-free people are going to want this. Uh, It is decadence, and Chef Jeremy knows all about decadence. He is the owner and executive chef of Jeremy's on the Hill California Style Bistro in Julian, which is San Diego's mountain destination in Southern California. So check it out. Go to Jeremy's on the Hill Dot com. You'll see his recipes and videos there, as well as on blendradioandtv.com. You'll see as, as one of our experts there. And uh, his flourless chocolate cake is going to be in mm. our uh, May-June issue of Big Blend Radio and TV magazine because, I don't know, we've got the baking thing going on in this issue, and uh, this one has no flour, and I think that's a good thing. But welcome back to the show, Chef Jeremy. How are you? I'm doing great. How are the ladies? We're good. We're always good. We're dandy. We're happy. And we're talking about chocolate. And that means wine is involved. So we're all good. You know, just saying. But um, this is this is interesting because you're talking about a flourless cake, chocolate, like a flourless chocolate cake. And that's got to appeal to a lot of people that are steering away from any kind of, you know, flour or grains in their food. It does. Um, one of the more modern trends of dieting that's been going around is staying away from gluten. Um, I love gluten. I think flour is magical, but uh, we do want to offer our dining patrons who are uh, more sensitive to this, whether it's a celiac disease, uh, whether Mm -hmm. it's a dietary preference, or as Mm -hmm. a diner, if you're just looking to try something new, uh, we we, we threw this on the, on the menu as an opportunity to, Mm -hmm. uh, tease the taste buds a little bit and we figured what better way than for our diners to try something out of the ordinary than mixing it with chocolate so Mm -hmm. this cake is it's delicious it's light it's airy it's fluffy um the techniques that are used to make it um avid home cooks can do it at their own pace at their own place um it's really using basic ingredients that we have at our house and uh Mm -hmm. just taking it up a notch and trying something new with them. Okay. So when he, when you talk about doing this, cause there's double broilers involved and I'm like already going, okay, maybe I shouldn't touch the wine first, or maybe I really should. Um, but th- there's, there's some stages to this. There's three stages. There's the actual cake. And then there's the actual, like the chocolate that you want for the chocolate sauce. And then you have the Chantilly cream, which has Grand Marnier in there. I'm just saying, like, you, you could just yeah. do this recipe for that. Um, so it's interesting because there's three levels of it, and it's a little different. And baking is always tricky no matter what you're doing. And I think that this is something that is a nice challenge for people. What What do you think of this compared to doing a souffle? Because to me, like, this is – I know – doesn't a souffle, like a chocolate souffle – it does have flour in it, but it seems to me like it's almost in that way of getting it right, and um, it, it still has that chocolatey goodness, obviously. But I know a souffle is like if you can do that, you're you're good. Souffle is the uh, the kingpin of a, of a culinary kitchen. If you can do a souffle in your restaurant, you are mm-hmm. extremely dedicated to mastering and creating of souffles. Or what we've done in the past is if we have a slower night. Then we'll experiment mm-hmm. with souffles and put them on as a dessert special on any given day. There's a lot mm-hmm. of work uh, when making a souffle, mm-hmm. and it's all a la minute, meaning mm-hmm. you can only whip the egg whites for your souffle so far in advance. Yeah. Um, the chocolate flourless yeah. cake, the most difficult part is separating the egg yolks from the egg whites, understanding what soft peaks are, which is when you're using your KitchenAid at home. Uh, you put your mm-hmm. egg whites in the Kitchen egg, KitchenAid with a whisk attachment and you start whipping Mm. them. The reason I say the yolks and excuse me, when I say separating the egg yolks and the egg whites is the most difficult part. That's because if you get any yolk inside of the egg white, uh, the proteins will not rise. Egg whites are protein, Mm. egg yolk is fat. So by separating the two, it's okay to get a little bit of the egg white in with the yolks, but you don't want to get any of the yolk in with the egg white. Otherwise, Mm. while you're whisking these egg whites, you will not be Mm. able to raise and elevate 
them uh, to create and form soft peaks or medium peaks. Um, I would like a what, medium peak. I'm just yeah. saying. <laughs> it's like, so, but you're gonna whip it up. But I mean, it's true, you know. Like when you're whipping eggs, if you if there's even just a teeny bit of yolk, but separating egg yolks from egg whites. There's it's, tools it's, for that now. But it's it's really not hard unless you crack the egg so hard that it's already yeah, you've demolished you've, it. You've already broken the yolk so within the, the white. The, the trick the trick with cracking eggs is you only want to crack it once. If you start cracking yes. it two and three times, you're more yeah, susceptible to breaking that egg yolk. So by yeah. only cracking it once, uh there's two ways you can separate yolks from white. One of them is taking your eggshell once you crack it breaking it in half mm -hmm. so you capture the mm -hmm. yolk in one side oh, yeah. and then yeah. you just kind of bounce the yolk back and forth. What most back professional bakers do is once we crack the egg, we'll slice it or excuse me, we'll we'll crack it into our hands and our fingertips will just be centimeters apart from each other. And what that'll do is it'll allow you to hold the egg yolk in your hand, meaning oh. right over the tips of your fingers and shake it and mm -hmm. then all the whites will fall between them. And oh, then what you do You'll you'll notice while doing this, there's a little bit of white that hangs onto the yolk. That is called mm -hmm. the tail. So when you pinch that tail, um, you will separate the yolk from the last remaining bit of the white. And when that happens, the white falls into the white bowl, and then you just kind of dollop or throw the yolk into the bowl right next to it, which again is where we separate the two. Okay, I, I want to watch Nancy do this so I can see her. No, I know the tail. because no, because I make <laughs> omelets all the time. I know there's the the it's, part. It's like the big, the part that's actually white. It's the glue because, piece because the egg whites are actually clear. The yolk is yellow, and then there's that little tail feather part dangly thingy that's actually white and opaque. So yes. that's what you're talking about. Yeah, correct. I've never put it in my hand like that. Oh, oh boy! Okay. I can't wait! I can't wait to see Nancy get in and play well, with the I eggs again. I get frustrated when you're getting scrambled eggs. Oh, okay. So while we're talking <laughs> about eggs, okay. So we buy eggs that are organic, cage-free, happy, good, good egg things, right? And we had those, like a you know, like little twelve pack or whatever they have them, dozen eggs. And then you have the. I went and got more. We got the two cartons switched up could be the wine from the night before but the next morning we opened the, the old one first and I mean the, the new one first and so they have like labels on like best by this date best by that date and so where are we on how long you can really have eggs that, that's okay for you to eat like because I was like oh my gosh this is going to be bad by this date and we ate all the fresh ones first you know what I mean you know you know, yeah, I, I do. Um, you know, and I worked at a coffee shop, and if you used to go to grandma and grandpa's house, they'd leave their eggs out all night. It wasn't something Ow. that needed to be refrigerated. Um, over time, granted, if you leave them out overnight, you're going to eat them within a couple of days. Um, coffee shops I used to work at, they would leave the eggs out all day during service, and it was fine. Really? Um, I'm sure some of our uh, health department friends would be rolling over in their graves, but yeah. I'm, I'm very practical about. Mm. looking at eggs and smelling an egg and when you crack an egg if it's rotten um we I, I think safely you could have eggs for seven to ten days ten days might almost be pushing it um anything over two weeks i'd get really weary about and when i get weary i'd rather just not serve it at all and mm -hmm. i'll um man i'll either throw them away which i hate doing or else mm. i will scramble them up um you can buy eggs that are pasteurized the problem with pasteurizing is you lose a lot of uh, God's natural desire and natural flavor and anything that's mm -hmm. pasteurized means it's heated up to a certain point mm -hmm. and it kills anything yeah. that's living. That's mm -hmm. why liquid yeah. eggs, when, um, they add citric acid to them. But when, when you ingest liquid eggs, there's no Ew. flavor. There's nothing yeah. like cracking an egg and always looking at the different color of the yolk. Even when you go to mom and pop farms or farmer's markets, the color yeah. of that yolk should be like a fire. It should be like a psychedelic orange. And what that yeah. means is that the chickens are actually getting protein and they're eating nutrients. And it could be uh, picking ants or uh, pincher bugs or uh, whatever, whatever is in their cornmeal diet that's uh, in increasing protein. Um, and our, the byproduct that humans benefit from when we eat eggs is a more fiery, vibrant, uh, gorgeous mm. colored yolk that's going to hold together uh, mm. better. There's a chef yeah. down in 
um, can't remember what state it is, but his name's Sean Brock, and I was reading his mm. cookbook, and he has a farmer who feeds his chickens uh, cayenne pepper. And chickens wow. cannot taste heat, but what that does is all the yolks that are that all the yolks from the mm -hmm. eggs of that farmer's chicken are the most intense, fiery red color. Um, but hmm. it's something that, you know, again, animal rights people, I'm letting you know that chickens can't taste capsaicin. So they can just eat this cayenne pepper mixed in with their diet and their yolk turns this bright, fiery color. But the, um, is there a benefit? Yeah, it was a there, benefit. What's the benefit other than the color? Or is that going to be like cheese, what the, what the sheep eat? You know, like I know in Europe, they have the different, you know, you're eating clover today and that's what your cheese tastes like. You know, I yeah. don't know if it alters the flavor at all. I do know that capsaicin mm. and spicy peppers, anything spicy that has heat to it, is really good for your joints. Mm. Um, oh, okay. So, so there fair. might be some medicinal properties as far as that goes. Mm. Um, mm. But I would be surprised if there was a significant flavor change. I think it's more for visual appeal for culinary mm. dishes okay. and for that elevating your dining experience to the next level. That I always Magical. thought that if your yolk was like that orange, like, you know, here it is, I'm a yolk, you know, that that was a fresher egg. And that if it wasn't a orange yolk, that it was an old egg. No, that's just their diet. So that's why you can go to the grocery store and get a carton of eggs that's just mm. fresh off the shelf at your local everyday supermarket that's not organic. And those yolks, those eggs might have been harvested a week ago, maybe 10 days ago, and you get them. And they're bright yellow. It just has to do with their diet. And that's also when you crack the eggs in the shell. Um, if the mm. shell is very brittle, that has to do with their diet also. So uh, eggs that you actually have to crack that have a thicker membrane around yeah. uh, the inside of the shell, but on the outside of the yolk and the white, um, that's mm. a more healthy chicken. You can tell because in some eggs, there's a whole lot of whites and a tiny yolk, and then others have a big yolk and less white. Yes. Hmm. And it and the harder the shell to crack, the bigger the yolk. Hmm. It's those double hmm. yolks that I feel bad for those chickens for. <laughs> Are we gonna yodel? No, anyway. <laughs> just have, I don't know why I felt like yodeling, but anyway. Yodel egg. So, <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Um so this let's talk about the cake part because that's where okay, you're separating the egg whites and the yolks. So like I was saying, there's a three point uh process to this. Fourth being, you get to eat it and drink wine. Can we drink wine while we make this? I mean, how long I, will it take? Um, once the, the 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 most tedious part again about this is more so than anything is measuring out all your ingredients, uh, mm -hmm. making sure that your egg yolks and egg whites are separated properly. Um, once your cake is in the oven, you're going to be looking at about uh, maybe a forty forty five minute cooking time, and um, I say 40 to 45 minutes, one, because everybody's oven works differently. So in yeah. this recipe, that's why I added a little um, clause in there that, you know, the best way to tell when your, your chocolate flourless cake is done is when the sides of the cake start pulling away from your spring fold pan. Uh, mm. that, that mold is there not only to help your cake rise and control it so it doesn't just go everywhere, but it's also an indicator for when the sides of the pan are hot enough and the cake starts pulling away from that. Uh, it's easier to remove the spring mold uh, from the pan, and mm. Uh, mm. that's okay. That's what. That's, that's just what we do. That, that that's the best way to cook it. Now let's talk about this pan. Is it a, so? It's a mold, but it's also a spring form pan. It's like so tell what us it, about the pan. So if you have like say say you had like a pie shell or like the bottom of a pie pan, what makes a spring mold good uh, for cheesecakes as well as this chocolate flourless cake recipe? is you're able to remove the sides of the pan with like a little lever. So mm -hmm. you have this bottom pan that looks, or this bottom pie tin looking thing. Then you put this spring mold around the pan and you pull this little lever, which actually grabs the sides of the pan and, and shrinks it down so it adheres to the bottom of your, your, your pan. Um, that prevents uh, flowers or liquid ingredients from slipping through the cracks. Um, mm. which is very important for cheesecakes because cheesecakes we cook in a water bath. But for this oh, particular wow. recipe, it allows, um, it, it assures us that when we have this liquid of 
chocolateless, chocolate flourless deliciousness goo pouring into the spring molded pan, it uh, keeps everything in its place without having to worry about it sipping through the cracks. We don't want to lose mm. any of that um, filling when we start baking these cakes. So again, that lever on the spring form pan uh, tightens it up. It's almost like a pulley, like if you were tying something down on the back of your car, and it just yeah. it gets it that much tighter. That's what the, the, the pan's purpose is. Well, the thing yeah. is, none of us want chocolate, you know, going through the cracks. That's just not going to happen no. for us. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it's interesting because we've gotten, we've gotten all these tools that we didn't have years ago, like for baking. It's, it's really amazing what we have to help it's us, great. you know, so, you know, people like me can a attempt this. I used to bake when I was a kid. I was really into baking and really good and got into the science of it. And then I don't know what happened. Did you discovered boys? No. <laughs> and I didn't. I should have used the skills. I'd be happier now. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so I just say. But um, but this is interesting. So now we go from this, you know, this spring form pan, and then you're going to play with double broilers or double boilers, right? I always call them do yep. double broilers. But boilers. don't be intimidated boilers. by the name. A double boiler yeah. is just a medium sized pot that has about two cups of water in it that you put over a flame on the stove top, bring it to a light boil. Then you take another metal bowl, place it on top of that metal's mm -hmm. key or glass because you don't want it to break. And what that does is the steam from the pot melts the chocolate down and melts the butter down inside of what is called a double boiler. So you can microwave the chocolate. I don't believe in microwaves. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to get fancy, mm -hmm. you could just take a metal bowl over the flames and stir it, pull it off. But you don't want it to scorch. You don't want that chocolate to burn. You also don't yeah. want that chocolate to separate. That's why I recommend the double boiler technique. Huh. It's not hard. It's it's, sounds, gen it's more gentle on the ingredients. It, it, it sounds no, like it, it isn't hard. I used to do that all the time. It's really not hard. It just sounds difficult, but it's not. Hmm. How interesting. I mean, I, it, this is just like a different technique, you know, Jeremy. And I think that's an exciting thing to try. For me, like. I've had, uh, you know, the flourless chocolate cake, and to me, it was really decadent, and you didn't need to have a whole bunch of it. You know, there's like, I, I feel like the mass-produced cake, and there is such a thing as mass-produced cake, believe it or not, there's this salty dryness stuff that there isn't this decadence well, like you go, oh, yeah, but it's kind of like eating junk food, right, where you're like, oh, your brain triggers into it, and then you'll still eat it, and then you're eating 10 times more of it. When you want to have a really good treat, like something like this, you don't, it's like a good chocolate fudge kind of experience where you could have it with port or, you know, whatever wine you want. But it, this is like a nice decadent moment of your life that you, you, I couldn't yeah, and agree if you more. can create it, it's good, right? Yeah. It's perfect. You, it's perfect for dinner parties. Yeah. Okay. So if you're having friends, because nobody's going to, yeah, no one's having that big chunk. It's like a little bit for everybody. And do you make it ahead of time if you're going to have a dinner party? You can make it the day of, and f feel free to make it a day or two ahead of time. We make one oh, about wow. every three days, or we make a couple of them every few days. Um, what that does is uh, if we get birthdays or special events, it allows us to spiffy up the cake, and we take it a, a couple levels above what this recipe calls for. Um, mm -hmm. It's just it, it's a great versatile cake. Um, I will say if you leave it in your refrigerator for more than a day, Please cover it with plastic wrap um, with these flavors that oh, are yeah. so natural and delicate. And there's, there's really no art there is no artificial preservatives that there. Mm -hmm. I would consider saying that there's some preservatives because there is butter in there and butter, you know, fat is a preservative. Um, cover it with plastic wrap. That way it doesn't th those flavors mm -hmm. in your refrigerator don't stick to the cake and they don't impart an impurity or take away from the potency of this dish. Mm. Mm. OK. And, and yeah, you want to keep it nice and moist. Because that's the word that is, of the year. That is everybody the word wants of the a, year. Everybody wants a moist cake. Now, okay, so you make the cake, and everyone, the recipe's up on Blend Radio and TV.com, and it's also featured in the May June issue of Big Blend Radio and TV magazine. And um, and you can go to the website for that. But the chocolate sauce. So is this like if you're going to have a dinner party? And like we're we're about to do that, but I don't think we're gonna like go to this extent. I don't know, man. If I'm doing it, this is scary. I could try. You could do it. I'll but do then it. that's just I don't know, man. I really love baking. There's a science to it. Do you have to worry before I get into this? Do you have to worry about like 
the fall, like if you close the oven door and then the cake falls and all yes. that, do you have to worry about that with this? Uh, even no, though not with this recipe, no. Um, That's the one of the things thing. I love about this recipe is there is a science to baking, but one of the most mm -hmm. zenful moments for myself is when you bake something, it's a great time to tell people, do not interrupt me because I am baking. There's a lot of steps that need to be me. met with time requirements. It doesn't mean stress out or worry about it if you're going too fast or too slow, but it's a great way for you to detach from everything in your life and just focus on the cake. Um, I right. think that is mm. the flip side to bakers in the culinary world versus uh, chefs or uh, oh, line oh, cooks. Yeah. The, the, the baking is, it, you can't rush it. You can't force it. The whole kitchen could be flying, you know, hurrying up, cutting more onions, chopping garlic, making aioli for different mm. sauces, for mayonnaise, uh, reducing veal yeah. bones. You know, you're in a hurry. You got to do a smaller batch really quick. You can't do that with baking. It's just very, yeah. it's very uh, classical music like. It's one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And it's, it's just going to do what it does. Oh, la, it's, la. No, because it needs, it's chemistry. When you get down to it, baking is chemistry. So, so yeah. bakers are like, you can't mess with me in the kitchen. They're just no, like, dude, because, that's and, it. And I know that's from, <laughs> I know from the, having done some baking and making bread that you can't just, there's some things you can just like, okay, add a little more cheese yeah. or do a little more that. But what you can't mess with is You can't them, keep tasting. You can't mess with the amount of baking powder, baking soda, Yeah, once it's flour, in, it's in. No, and yeast. You can't mess with that because it's a, it's scientific formula wow. that makes it work wow and so what what happens in a place like i know there's restaurants where the pastry chefs are there and then they at a certain time they're like they're done like mm -hmm. is there a rivalry between chefs and pastry chefs <laughs> i don't like think at so all? i think it, i think mm -hmm. the only rivalry i'm aware of and that i see is the front of the house and the back of the house because the back yeah. of the house goes yeah hurry yeah, up take always. your food what's taken so long but a majority of people in the back in the house never worked in the front of the house so right if they're sat with like three tables all at once and you know all it mm. takes is for that waiter to bring out a burger a chicken sandwich and a nice salad mm. and say fish and chips they go out to the table one of them goes oh can i get ketchup and the waiter goes all the way back to the kitchen grabs the ketchup comes back to the mm. table and then one of them goes oh i would like ketchup and then the waiter goes yeah. all the way back to the kitchen goes all the way back to the table and the guy with fish and chip goes oh um i don't like this sauce do you have any tartar sauce and then the waiter goes all the way back and by this point the guys in the kitchen are like dude take the rest of your food and the waiter is like i can i'm dealing with you know people who can't yeah, handle all their yeah. condiments at the same time condiments are the number one killer i think for waiters well i wow. agree i agree and yet nobody wants them on the you can't bring them to the table earlier nobody wants no. them on the table it's annoying no. Yeah. And it, like in a diner, here's all your plastic wrapped ones, right? But yeah. it's different in, in your restaurant. Mm -hmm. It's different. It's an experience. And he, half of the condiments are like, here, we made them for you. And yeah, then it's you know, like, it's... oh, I saw this. Oh, now I want it. You're yeah. asked as a diner, would you like this? Oh, no, I'm watching my weight. I and don't want any like, salad okay, dressing. But he got I'll it. Have it so on now the side. I want it. I know. It's yeah. like, <laughs> oh, and, that, and it becomes a domino <laughs> effect because everybody looks at each other's food. You know, I know that even it's just so photographing, funny. photographing in stores, so I'll be photograph or a restaurant, I'll be photographing something. Next, you know, I will have that. What she's photographing, it's like how do we, uh, what's, yeah. that, what's the name? Uh, when Sa Sally met Harry met Sally. Yeah. And uh, it's like I want what she's having, and that's what happens in a restaurant. It happens in a store. Mm -hmm. If somebody likes something and makes a big yeah, now we want everybody wants the same dress. Can't yeah. have it. You know. Yeah. It's so funny. It's interesting. That's just the human condition. But okay, so going back to the baking of this, this is interesting. So where this is actually going to be an easier recipe to follow in a way. There it may is, be three uh, parts of it. Then it's easier yeah. than the, the the floury kind of stuff that we we don't yeah. we can do this easier. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay. Once 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 you get all your ingredients together, from there it's a breeze. There there's no the, the biggest thing I see home cooks messing up is they don't gather all their ingredients. We, we, mm -hmm. we chefs call it mise en place, putting all your ingredients in the right spot. Once I you have know. all of your prep and all of your ingredients, mm -hmm. so all you have to do is mix, add, fold, do this, do that. 
put in the oven, pull out, plastic wrap, yeah. fridge, make this, do that. It, it's it's a breeze. Because then it, you're just, people get intimidated yeah. when they read recipes and they see how long it is. But part of what a home cook should be looking for is when they read recipes is follow who's making those recipes and how easy it is for them to read that recipe. Once you mm. read 20 or 30 recipes from myself or others in this magazine and you master it, then look for another chef who might write things a little more com uh, complex. Then look mm. for somebody else. Then look for somebody else. But I, I highly urge uh, home cooks to find somebody who, whose style of recipe writing they admire and that they could follow. And, 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 and go off of their repertoire, go off of their index or encyclopedia of Get starting, recipes. yeah. But yeah. isn't that with then anything? Yeah, you, that's how you learn how to do something is you start with somebody. Like when, when you started cooking, I mean, we remember you as, as a very young boy, Jeremy, cooking. You know, you cooked for, you know, weddings. I remember you cooking as breakfast. I mean, I, you you've done years of it before people know i mean it, it's a, an amazing story that you have as a chef is there when you were when you were getting into this and realizing that hey i'm into this and and started following recipes i never saw you really follow recipes i just never saw that part of it but maybe you were was there any specific chefs you were following um you know um not off the top of my head that's just something that I picked up on from when I do like research for recipes. Yeah. When I read cookbooks, it's, it, it makes a lot more sense when I open hero foods. And, you know, once I've read 10 recipes, um, I get the style. Um, and you that, understand what he's trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Seamus. Yeah. Yes. He's, he's awesome. And so it, it's interesting when you do that, because I think it is about, it's like even as a singer trying to learn my craft, I learned through different musicians, so I'd sing like the singers until I got to that place of like, okay, now I can go do something else and I can be myself. You learn through different channels. It's very interesting what you're saying about recipes. I never thought of it that way. It's cool. It's very it's, cool. But it's totally crazy. Yeah. So now, okay, the chocolate sauce. Let's get to the goods. The chocolate sauce going on mm. the, the flourless chocolate cake. Here's the level two, right? So this Bitter is the sauce. most controversial part of the recipe because there's corn oh. syrup in there. A lot of people have yeah. feelings about corn syrup, and I am not yeah. a fan of corn syrup. I provided corn syrup in this recipe because I wanted it to be able to last in your kitchen uh, for up to two weeks. I wanted mm -hmm. you to be able to experiment with it on ice creams, on cakes, chocolate milks, um, and your favorite coffee drink. Um, so I did add corn syrup to this recipe. And what that does, mm -hmm. this is the catch-22, is you can pull that cake out of the refrigerator and the corn syrup will, even if you just pull the cake out and cut it, it will prevent your cake, your, the chocolate sauce, from getting so hard that it's brittle and it breaks and it looks like crap mm. on your cake. So the yeah. corn syrup is kind of the velvety magic in the sauce. Um, oh, I'm wow. a big fan of Julia Childs' quote, everything in moderation, even moderation. Um, but this particular recipe for chocolate sauce is a winner. It's solid. Um, you can add a little a pinch of cayenne pepper. You can add a little star anise mm. to it. There's a lot of Ooh, variations like that. that you can do and a lot of different subtle flavors. You can add a little Maldon sea salt on there. You can add a little mm. bit of a little bit of coffee to it while you're making it if you want to kick it up a notch or a shot of espresso. And it'll, it'll do magic. You'll be able to taste it. Wow. So that goes through the first one mm. through and then you start messing with it, right? It's like that's what Correct. I think about the recipes that you, you're sharing with us. There are recipes that people can master and then make their own, and it can be they can create their own signature dish. You know, yeah, you just tweak an ingredient or two, and then all of a sudden you just created something magical that yeah you know, makes you feel like you're a chef, and that you know you've now taken your repertoire of knowledge and what you see on TV and what you read in magazines and uh, what sweets are at the farmers market that are natural. You shave a little bit of that into the chocolate sauce, or pour a shot of this in there, and you have something. Yeah, that yeah, you yeah. Would have. <laughs> yeah. like, you said mm. shot you said shot so like hello like you could put a little hello. orange orange liqueur in oh. with that chocolate dude there's something or about shaved, that or shaved orange yeah yeah oh actually just mm -hmm. put the orange okay see i'm liking that yeah that would work yeah mm -hmm. now orange and chocolate. what about berries berries um i think if you when you're making the chocolate sauce the problem with berries is there's seeds and some of it could be too fibrous mm. and it'll stand out in the chocolate sauce 
Um, if you had like a raspberry puree you wanted to make or some extra strawberry jam laying around in your walk in your refrigerator That's or on your way. shelf, go for it. Add a little bit of that. Okay. But you, you, could, you actually you, serve this cake on you, berries. You could also do mint. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mint, yeah. For really? that, um, when you're, when you're cooking that heavy, when you're bringing that heavy cream, when you're, when you're cooking that for the chocolate sauce, throw some mint mm. in there, chiffonade it really small, add mm. it to it and then strain it before you mix it with the chocolate. And, um, mm. then you'll mm. have mint flavored cream and then you'll be able to taste that in the chocolate sauce. Wow. Okay. So everyone, this is a chocolate sauce recipe. You've got bittersweet chocolate. So you're not doing milk chocolate. You're doing bittersweet. Correct. And that's the thing, even through the cake, it's like, no, we're not doing, you know, because that is, they've already added stuff to that. Right. So that's why this is like almost like the purest chocolate thing, because when it's bittersweet, we haven't added all, we haven't added all the milk to that chocolate, right? We haven't cut the product yet. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the in, it's integrity to the product. Let's put it integrity. You you said that once in the show. The integritistic product or something like that. I was like, I love that. That is still one of my favorite things. It's like, yeah, you let it be. Uh, so a cup of heavy cream and and half a cup of corn syrup. That's your sauce, and you you heat it up together again using the do a double boiler method, and that's cool because it doesn't overheat it so fast. But then. You have this Grand Marnier Chantilly cream and a pretty face and a ponytail hanging down and a wiggle and a walk. Okay. All right. Okay. Nice. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your Chantilly cream. You got okay, this so, is like the um, final it's part. A fancy, it's a fancy word for whipped cream. So I referenced uh, whipped cream while making this recipe. So when you're using your KitchenAid again with the whisk attachment. When you're taking your heavy cream and your powdered sugar or confection sugar, same thing, you're whisking mm. that. And what you're doing, similar to the egg whites when you whisk those for the cake, by whipping the heavy cream, you're folding air into it. And that's what transforms it from a liquid like that you would put in your coffee to this light, fluffy, elegant pile of mm. cream with delicious oh. Grand Marnier in there that just you put it on yeah. your tongue and it just starts mm. folding apart and dripping down the sides of your tongue and gets you salivating around your cheeks. And that shot of Grand Marnier that you add, it just really just opens it up a little bit more. And it, it takes your palate a little bit more complex. It's a little bit more that you taste. And there's just enough it's Grand Marnier in there that if you don't tell somebody, they'll pick up on the subtleness of the orange flavor that's coming through. And again, that's another conversation piece. That, that's another great thing about food with these little hidden gems that are bursting at different layers is when, when you bake this for your, your friends or your family, um, your, your husband might go, oh my gosh, what, I, I'm tasting uh, mint in this. And then you can be like, oh yes, I, um, I, I chiffonaded some mint and then I, I folded it in with the heavy cream and strained it. And as soon as you say that, your husband's going to be like, oh my God, what is she talking about? Or he's about? like, I, I beg your pardon, you were chiffonading with the mint? <laughs> Who's the mint, man? Stop chiffonading with him. I can't remember the last time I chiffonaded. I know. The last time I did was really good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, but I think you're right. It's like everybody can, it's like wine tasting, right? And and food should be part of that. It's like, oh, I taste this and have that conversation and then think about, hey, where does chocolate come from? You yeah. know? What's going on? We got to protect the, the the world of chocolate. We've got to we got to protect that our rainforests and everything so we can keep it going. But Chef Jeremy, always always a pleasure to have you join us on Big Ben Radio and Eat Drink Be Merry. Uh, this is definitely an Eat Drink Be Merry show. So um, on the merry part, what are we drinking with this, and what music goes with it? As you know, I'm gonna parent. I'm gonna say some um, whew, you know a nice ten year tawny port. Maybe a thirty mm -hmm. year, uh, if not yeah. a, a nice shot of brandy, a couple fingers, and uh, mm. let it just relax with you and enjoy each sip. Um, mm. Brandy would pair really nice with that uh, Chantilly cream, and the chocolate would help cut some of the alcohol potency. Yeah. Um, if I was going for a port, um, I would I, I, I'd steer towards the Tawny port. Tawnies usually have more chocolatey. Uh, mm 
dark fruit profile. So that'll, that'll complement all the ingredients in this dish very well. Um, as far as music goes, um, I've been on a reggae kick lately, so I'm going to have to say some steel pulse. Mm. Um, wow. Yeah. Relax. Hopefully by the time you're on this course, you've had a bottle of wine. A bottle of wine is not a lot of wine. It's only three cups. So a <laughs> bottle of I wine know. in person <laughs> is highly acceptable. Um, Get some that, sand between your toes while you're doing yeah, it. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's it, The sun's out. It's it's popping. It's lively. The colors of the, the forests are blooming. The, the bounty from the gardens are growing and the colors outside are phenomenal. This is a great dish to have out on the porch uh, with your loved ones and friends and a great way to end the night. Okay, but isn't it also a good date night dish? Just saying. Absolutely. In that case, this we're is... going to go, we're only going to do one bottle of wine because we want to save uh, energy for extracurricular activities. And I'm going the to The music's going to change? We're going to switch no? from Steel Pulse. We're going to go to a little... Frank Sinatra, maybe a little Dean Martin, some Rat Pack, and um, maybe some Barry White. Hey, baby, Barry hey, baby. White. Maybe a little <laughs> little Marvin Gaye as you're leaving the restaurant or leaving the dining room and headed to the next room. Right or, on, yeah, dude. He's like, he's really he's got it really going. Okay, I gotta like Dean Martin. I that. know Dean Martin. Nancy, he just say oh, Dean Martin, and yeah, she's I'm like, she's okay. gone. She's left. She's left the building. Mm -hmm. But everybody, <laughs> uh, you can either experience this at Jeremy's on the Hill, uh, up in Julian in the mountain town. Beautiful, beautiful destination. Talk about romance. Uh, summer romance. Listen, get away from the beach, the June gloom. It happens. Go up to the mountains. There's B&Bs. There's all kinds of Airbnbs. There's romantic, you know, little motels, hotel things. And uh, stay there. Go hang out in the woods. Then go eat at Jeremy's and have this mm. beautiful cake and a romantic dinner, some local wines. That's the thing. Everything's local, local beer, beautiful experience. But also try this at home. So check it out. The recipe, again, is on blendradioandtv.com. You'll see Jeremy, Chef Jeremy, in our expert department. And also go see more of his recipes at jeremysonthehill.com. Sign up for his newsletter because he does have a giveaway every month in his newsletter for subscribers. You can win a $25 gift certificate to the restaurant, which is very, very cool. So, uh, Chef Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. My pleasure. And we got a little music for you, you know. It's called Summer Wine because mm. it's about love and all that good stuff. So, everybody, Summer Wine, it is from Shelly King. Go to ShellyKing.com and it's Shelly with an E-Y, ShellyKing.com. From her album, Fan Faves, don't forget Big Blend Radio airs live Monday through Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, and Fridays and Sundays at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Go to BigBlendRadio.com for that. Thanks all for joining us. Thinking about getting away Baby, I just need a little escape Away from all this busy and around Find a little time to come unwound It's so easy to get caught up in this race With so many dreams to chase Then I hear that song on the radio Wanna go out in the sunshine, sip a little summer wine, slow dancing in the park, stay there till after that sweet sound, soft and low song on the radio. Maybe we could take a little drive. Past the city to the countryside Holding hands and talking about love Away from all this push and shove Take some time to look into your eyes Reconnect our disconnected lives Remember how it used to be 
All that mattered was you and me It's so easy to get caught up in this race With so little time to waste Then I hear that song on the radio Making me wanna go out in the sunshine Sip a little summer wine Slow dancing in the park Stays there till after dark Sweet sound, soft and low Song on the radio After all is said and done You know you are my only one Oh darling, give your Hear our song on the radio Making us wanna go out in the sunshine Sip a little summer 